Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I want to welcome each and every one of you to the Yamarna Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I see we have a few visitors this morning. Welcome. Glad that you guys can join us this morning and chose this place to wor uh, worship. A couple of announcements. <clears throat> uh, at, right after the service, everyone's invited to the fellowship lunch in the fellowship hall, so please stay. Also, this coming Friday, 
Vespers is being hosted by the Women's Ministry, and it starts at 6 p.m., and it'll be in the Fellowship Hall. Also, next week, Sabbath, there is a memorial service for Ophelia Pangan. It's at 5, starting at 5 p.m., and goes to 7. And the day after, November 5th, at 10 a.m., is the funeral service. <clears throat> also, for those of you that haven't heard, our, one of our members, uh, dad has passed away, Jessica Blanco. His dad has passed away. Uh, there will be cards going around, um, around the congregation, and if you can sign it and uh, put a message of condolences to her, and then if you want to give anything to her in this time of need, uh, just put it in the envelope when you get the card. Also next Sabbath, uh, Armona Union Academy has their alumni day. So we will have both children's and adult Sabbath schools here at the church. And then at 1045, you will join the AUA alumni day worship service at the gym. Uh, our, pa our own uh, pastor, Dan Martella, will be the speaker. And his topic is growing up Adventist. The traditional haystack dinner will be served by our Armona Jaguar Pathfinders. And then in the evening, we will enjoy the festivities of the harvest auction. And today is a special day. It is uh, Religious Liberty Day, and it's being led by Alan Reinock, who is the executive director of the Church State Council and Education and Advocacy and Legal Service, Services Ministry of the Pacific Union Conference. This morning during the adult Sabbath school, he told us the story of, this, of a Sabbath accommodation case he recently took to the Supreme Court. And this morning during this worship service, he will talk about God's plan for Israel, which is a hot topic given the current Israel and Hamas conflict. And then after the fellowship lunch at two o'clock, he will be sharing important insights about Christian nationalism and the impact that is having on our country. And we invite you to join us for that important conversation. Our call to worship this morning is found in John chapter 16, verses 33. And it reads, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Father in heaven, we are so grateful to be together as a family here on the day that you have set apart for us to worship and to praise your name. We invite you into our midst, into our hearts, into our lives. Bless us now as, as we worship you in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, we are so glad that we are here together in our church and we are start our singing and praising our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I will read something in here about our first song. So, if you ever flown, you may have experienced taking off in a bad weather, then going through dark clouds and then suddenly flying into the brilliance of the sun shining above the clouds. They're saying that behind the clouds, the sun is always shining. And that is the picture of what should be true in the life of the believer. Though we believe in the world 
dark, with sin and pain and trouble, it is possible to find sunshine in our lives despite of the cir circumstances through the Lord Jesus Christ, who Malachi calls the Son of Righteousness. For our first song, let us sing, There is Sunshine in My Soul Today.
Don't you have a saying? It is still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. John 4, 35. There is more to farming than just picking the crop when it is ready. Orchards need to be pruned. Trees need to be netted so the birds don't eat the harvest. Fumigation and fertil fertilizers need to be applied or the bugs will decimate your crop. Your water, you water it by creating irrigation channels or by connecting pipes, making sure all your fields are watered. The farmer makes sure the plants don't freeze by placing heaters or covering them with plastic. But the crop still needs to reach its destination, the market, the juice factory, or the place where they will package the vegetables. There is a lot of work in order for the harvest to be ready. Just like in the harvest from the fields, timing is everything. Otherwise, the spiritual harvest goes to waste. Satan is always trying to spoil the harvest. The devil doesn't want the harvest to reach heaven. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has a very good system to preserve the harvest until it's ready for heaven. Our offering today goes to your local union conference. This is one of the levels of church whose sole purpose is to support the local conference to get the harvest ready for the second coming of Jesus. Will the deacons please rise? collect our offering. We come to you with hearts filled with gratitude for the abundance of blessings that you give us today and every day. Father, we pray that you will open our eyes to see that the harvest is ripe. Please bless our offering today so that we can be ready to bring the harvest home. In Jesus' name, amen.
It is now time for our children's story. So little ones, please come up. Is this working? You haven't seen a book like this before? Some yes, some no. Well, nearly 50 years ago, my wife's grandmother gave this to her. My wife must be getting old, huh? Nearly 50 years ago. And nearly 30 years ago, I used to read this to my children, some of these stories. My children must be getting old, huh? I'm sure glad I'm not. (laughs) So you have to work with me this morning, okay? Because you're going to help act this out. That's why my kids liked it, I think. We acted it out. So. This is entitled, Jesus and the Storm. So Jesus stood in a boat, a fishing boat with oars and a sail and talked to the many people who had come to hear him. All day long, Jesus told them stories. And when it was evening, Jesus said to his helpers, let us cross over to the other side of the lake and rest. So Jesus' helpers untied the boat, and they pushed it from the shore and raised the sail. Now you're all in the boat, right? raised the sail, and one man sat in the back of the boat to guide it with a steering tiller. The boat moved slowly at first and then faster and faster across the blue water. So you're in a boat. It's kind of nice out here tonight, isn't it? Going to reach outside the boat and touch the water? Is it cold? No, it feels great. Oh, it's getting late. Look at there's a moon. A round yellow moon came up over the lake and the stars twinkled high overhead. Jesus was so very tired, he lay down with his head on a pillow and was soon sound asleep. The man at the back steered carefully and the boat sailed on and on and on. Suddenly, a fierce wind began to blow. Help me out. It blew a black cloud over the moon. It blew black clouds over the stars, and it whipped the water into huge, angry waves. 
Now you look way too calm because we're in the boat. So are you getting nervous? Yeah. You're getting wet. The waves tossed the boat this way and that way, up and down. There was lightning. Yeah. And there was thunder. The man at the tiller tried to steer the boat, but he couldn't. Other men tried to row the boat with oars, but they couldn't. The water filled the boat. It began to sink. The men were afraid. and They woke Jesus. Lord, save us. We perish. All the time. What's happening? <laughs> Jesus heard their cry for help. He felt the angry winds. He saw the lightning flash and he heard the noisy thunder, but he was not afraid. He stood up and said to the wind and the waves, peace, be still. The wind stopped blowing. The waves were still. The clouds went away and the stars twinkled again. The boat sailed on the sparkling path that the moon made on the water and crossed to the other side of the lake. Why were you afraid? Jesus asked his helpers. Why were you afraid when I was with you? Jesus says to boys and girls today, don't be afraid when the lightning flashes and the thunder crashes and the strong winds blow. I am with you always, says Jesus, in the dark and in the storm. I will never leave you. Don't be afraid. Now, sometimes you won't be in a boat and be tossed and turned and have the boat fill with water and lightning and thunder crash and all of that. But you do experience things that scare you, right? There's when times like that. I could describe a bunch of them. You could probably tell me a bunch of them that affect you. But that is when Jesus is there and he says, why are you afraid when I am with you? So the next time you feel like you are in a storm, whether it's a real one or your friends are mad at you, or, and on and on and on. Think about who is there with you in the storm. Jesus is, and you can pray with him. Is there a volunteer to pray with us this morning? Okay, let's pray. <laughs> Father in heaven, thank you so much for this Sabbath morning and for the chance to be here in church. Thank you for being a God that is with us in the storm. And thank you so much for being with us that we don't have to be afraid. Help us to always remember that. Amen. Okay, you can go back to your seats. Good morning and happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. May we all open our Bibles this morning to Matthew 24, 1 to 5, for our scripture lesson. I will be reading from the New King James Version this morning, and I'll start with verse 1. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not See all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. For those who are able, may you kneel with me in prayer. Glorious and Heavenly Father, 
this Sabbath day, we'd like to thank you for all the blessings you have given us throughout this week, uh, helping us all to be here this Sabbath day. We ask of you this morning that you may anoint the lips of our speaker, Attorney uh, Reynock. Reynock, we pray that you may be able to embody or be part of his message, Lord. And we pray that you may be here to help us and clear our hearts and minds and help us to understand it. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before our special music comes up here, I just want to introduce our guest speaker this morning. His name is Alan J. Reinock. He is a civil rights lawyer and a Seventh-day Adventist minister who has served as executive director of the Church State Council, the Education, Advocacy, and Legal Services Ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the Western United States since 1994. Reinock directs the Legal Services Ministry of the Church State Council, offering legal assistance to persons of all faiths complaining of religious discrimination in the workplace. His most notable achievement in the legal arena has been obtaining a 9-0 to zero ruling from the Supreme Court in the 23, uh, 2023 case of Groff versus DeJoy, redefining the standard of undue hardship required to justify an employer's denial of re religious accommodation. Previously, he drafted petitioner's brief in Hobby versus Florida resulting in a favorable 8-1 to one decision in a free exercise case. Reinock also directs the legislative advocacy work of the Church State Council, primarily focused on the separation of church and state and preservation of religious freedoms of peaceful people of faith. In 2012, Reinock helped draft and enact the California Workplace Religious Freedom Act, providing strong protections for re religious accommodation and has helped enact regulations to enforce its provisions. Reinock is also a recognized leader in the legal community on issues of religion and the law and serves as co-chair of the American Bar Association's Religious Freedom Committee, part of the ABA Civil Rights and Social Justice Section. He has also served for many years on the Legislative Committee of the California Employment Lawyers Association, working to advocate workers' rights. And now we'll give time to our Special music. Satisfied. 
about his love Think about his goodness Think about his grace that brought us through For as high as the heavens above So great is the measure of our Father's about his love, think about his goodness, think about his grace that brought us through, for as high as the heavens above, so great is the measure of Father's love. Thank you, ladies. That was beautiful. Hang on just a minute, church. So we can switch back over here. Well, I have been serving in this union for 30 years, and this is my first visit to Armona. I would say it's long overdue, and I'm very grateful. Uh, Dan and I somehow got messed up with the schedule last year I was supposed to come, but anyway, here I am. I've been looking forward to it for a long time, and uh, very happy to be worshiping with you. You know, I was kind of wondering, coming to Armona, you know, what kind of congregation am I going to see there, you know? Um, and um, not surprisingly, this congregation looks an awful lot like pretty much every other church I go to, which is, you know, that we are the most ethnically diverse denomination in the United States. And, you know, I see people from, you know, Asian ancestry and um, Mexican or South American ancestry and, and European, you know, we're, we're kind of a... Uh, a salad bowl, not a, not a melting pot, a salad bowl, right? A little bit of, little bit of everything. And uh, that's how God's family is. And it's very important that, you know, that we build community and that we, build, that we be a family um, united in Christ regardless of our political views. And I say that because... Um, we're going to touch on some things today that, well, prophecy is being fulfilled. I'm convinced of it. And it's becoming a very confusing time. Now, we gave out a couple of brochures in the bulletins. I guess they all made it in the bulletin. Our organizational brochure, you can learn more about the work of religious liberty that we do, a reminder about the fact that we have a special annual offering every year for religious liberty. This is something that's really important to the Adventist church. And, you know, you probably don't really think much about, well, what, what's the reputation of the Adventist church uh, in the larger world 
Uh, if, if you think about it all, you might think, well, we're known for our hospitals or our schools, but globally we're known also because we defend religious liberty for everyone. And, and we understand that to be part of the golden rule, right? You know, that we want the freedom to believe and to worship and to have our schools and, you know, and propagate our faith. Uh, and so we also understand it's important that other people have the same right to their faith. And that's very, very important to our reputation as, as a church. And so we publish Liberty Magazine and all kinds now of different uh, television and podcasts and what have you. Um, <clears throat> I've started a new podcast with the editor of Liberty Magazine. Um, it hasn't been launched yet. We're struggling with a title. The first title we picked was Liberty Matters. Turns out somebody else has a podcast called Liberty Matters. So we're back to the drawing boards and we'll figure that one out. Um, let's see if and then, okay, we talked a little bit this morning about our Supreme Court win, and we've strengthened your rights not to have to work on Sabbath. I dare say in every church, there are people who are working on Sabbath. Um, some of them may be perfectly content to work on Sabbath, but oftentimes they just don't know how to get out of it. And so, by all means, we're here to help I don't want you laying a guilt trip on anybody. I've often said, if somebody's going to risk losing their jobs, you know, to take a stand and, and not work on Sabbath, whether it's an old believer or a new believer, it better not be because, you know, Alan told them not to work on Sabbath, or you told them, or the pastor told them. It better be that they're following the leading of the Holy Spirit in their lives, Right? because then they have the confidence that God will see them through no matter what happens. It, you know, if they do it because I told them, then they may, like, blame me when everything goes wrong, right? When they lose their jobs and their house gets foreclosed on and all kinds of bad things. Now, it doesn't happen that much, but it can happen. It, you know, it certainly can. Uh, and last but not least, we're going to talk quite a bit today about Christian nationalism, which is now front page news because the new Speaker of the House has been associated with Christian nationalism. So it's very much um, something that you can read about in any of the major news outlets. Now let's see if we got this working. Well, did we, we did switch over. I'm seeing a light on here. Let's see here. That says off, this says on. Ah, you gave me wrong instructions. I pressed the wrong button. It's the up button that moves it. All right, there we go. Finding Jesus in an age of counterfeits. Today, it is my premise that we live in an age of counterfeits. In fact, we live in a post-truth age of alternative facts. Well, what are alternative facts? Well, according to, this was Oxford Dictionary's Word of the Year in 2016. And they define alternative facts uh, uh, as relating to, and, or, or post-truth age, rather, was the uh, Word of the Year. Um, <clears throat> relating to and denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. So, have you ever heard the saying, uh, my mind is made up, don't trouble me with the facts, right? Um, we make up our own facts uh, consistent with our own beliefs, we tend to believe the things that reinforce, that we believe as fact the things that reinforce what we already believe are our own values already. Um, <clears throat> you know, 
We've got some examples here of alternative facts from history, right? Going back a long ways. The earth is flat. Well, that was an alternative fact that people believed. Slavery is a good thing is an alternative fact that is uh, now being taught in the curriculum in the Florida public schools to some extent. Jews are the cause of Germany's troubles. That was an alternative fact, um, which, by the way, was something that the Arab nations, I don't know if you know this, they were very much aligned with Hitler. Um, and then there's the one that got my mom killed. Smoking does not cause cancer. So she started smoking um, as a young person back when they didn't think there was anything wrong with it. And it eventually killed her. She died of lung cancer. And today, um, as an alternative fact, I would propose the proposition that there is no such thing as global warming. Now, I don't know what things are like here in the Central Valley. Um, because of COVID, I was, able, I was working remotely, so we sold our home in California, and we moved to the desert outside of Scottsdale, Arizona. And this past summer, uh, you may have seen it in the news, it made national news. We had 31 straight days in July above 110 degrees. Now, they talk about the heat in Arizona being a dry heat. And I probably still would take our summer days above 110 to what it's like here when it's 105 and you know, the irrigation is going and you've got the humidity. Um, but I think there's one thing we can all agree on. It's too hot, right? It's just plain hot. Well, now we're dealing with artificial intelligence, right? So you want to call a company, customer service, and you get AI instead. You get automated whatever. And if you get a quick answer to an easy question, you know, or you get to pay your bill uh, quickly and easily, all to the good. But AI has also um, got all kinds of potential for mischief. As an attorney found out when he relied on AI to prepare a brief in a contract dispute in a case in New York. The opposing counsel files a brief in opposition and says, Your Honor, we looked up all the cases cited in this brief and, and they don't exist. We can't find them. Now, what got the attorney in trouble was not that he filed a brief full of cases, citations that were made up, but it's what he did after he was alerted to the fact that got him sanctioned and fined $5,000 by the court because he wouldn't back down. As bad as that is, there was another situation where ChatGPT uh, invented a sexual harassment scandal uh, and named a very prominent law professor who is, often appears on television. So this was reported, let's see, I don't have the date. Yeah, Washington Post, April 5th of this, earlier this year. And it said, and I quote from the article, one night last week, the law professor Jonathan Turley got a troubling email. As part of a research study, a fellow lawyer in California had asked the AI chatbot, ChatGPT, to generate a list of legal scholars who had sexually harassed someone. Turley's name was on the list. The chatbot created by OpenAI said Turley had made sexually suggestive comments and attempted to touch a student while on a class trip to Alaska, citing a March 2018 article in the Washington Post as the source of the information. The problem? No such article existed. There had never been a class trip to Alaska, and Turley said he'd never been accused of harassing a student. There's now a term for this, which is hallucinations. Um, chat 
you know, these, these AIs are prone to figuring out what you want to hear and, and telling you, making up information consistent with what they think you want to hear. Um, we've got a very contentious election cycle coming up next year. And between AI and the technology that's already been used for some years to create what's known as deep fakes, you can be sure that if you're on social media at all, you will see videos of politicians you either like or dislike saying things that are completely outrageous. And chances are, some of them will be fakes. And you won't be able to tell the difference, right? It's gotten to that level where even if you see a politician that you dislike saying something that, you know, you believe they would say, and I saw this recently, um, you got to check it out. You can't take anything for granted anymore because we live in an age of counterfeits. Oh, now I'm going, oh, I see. I had it upside down. Okay, you know what? I'm going to keep it in my hand, and that way I hopefully won't get confused. I'll just keep my finger on the button. All right, so we read the scripture, and frankly, I take my theme about this being an age of counterfeits from no less an authority than Jesus himself, because in his apocalyptic sermon about last day events, three times he keeps coming back to the theme that there are going to be false Christs and false messiahs. He says it over and over again. <clears throat> you know, when, when he's sitting on the Mount of Olives and overlooking the Temple Mount, and he's saying to his disciples that it's going to be destroyed, to them, it's no wonder that they, you know, get the destruction of the Temple and the end of the age and his second coming all blended up together because to them, the destruction of the Temple is the end of the world as they know it, right? And so that's, um, that's what he's addressing. And, of course, he says, you know, there'll be wars and rumors of wars. The end is not yet. He says, many will come in my name saying, I am the Messiah and will lead many astray. In our, in our lifetime, in our generation, there have been quite a few who have come claiming to be the Christ. Can you think of any? Help me out here. Anybody? Call it out. False Christs in our lifetime. Krishna, um, David Koresh, David Koresh, um, leader of the Branch Davidians, very close to home, a offshoot of Seventh-day Adventists. He claimed to be Jesus, to be Christ. Uh, the Central Spanish Church in uh, Los Angeles, the, the Central Adventist Spanish Church, um, it worships in the building, the, the church that used to be the home of uh, Jim Jones' group. You know, Jim Jones is one who led his followers down to, was it Kiana? And um, he claimed to be Christ, and uh, that's where we get the expression, don't drink the Kool-Aid, because they drank the Kool-Aid, and it was poisoned, and they all died. Um, I was speaking to the Asian pastors recently, and one of them, I, I'm bad with names, said that there is an Asian um, who claims to be the incarnation of Christ. Um, and of course, what about the Korean, uh, the Reverend Sun Myung Moon? When I was uh, a teenager, two of my close relatives became, we called them Moonies back in the day, right? Moon claimed to be Christ. Uh, one of them had to be kidnapped and uh, de we called it deprogrammed, literally de-brainwashed to get him out of the Moonies. The other one was my stepbrother. He became a Moonie for a time. So we've had 
our share of actual false Christs in our lifetime. But Jesus continues, says many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. We have a whole movement I'm going to talk about this morning uh, called the, the New Apostolic Reformation. They believe that God has raised up as many as 10,000 prophets here in the United States. Now, in the last two president, presidential elections, these prophets all claim to have received um, a prophetic message from the Holy Spirit as to God's choice uh, to be president, that who God called to be president. Now, if you think about it, they had a 50-50 chance of getting it right, didn't they? Because it could, had to be one of two guys. And uh, the first time around, they got it right. Now, the second time around, uh, the wrong guy wound up in the White House, according to them, but they didn't back down and admit that they were wrong. They supported the idea that the election was somehow stolen or a product of fraud. And, and I suspect that there's an awful lot of Americans who believe that the election was stolen, in part, no small part, because, well, the Lord said it. And that was good enough for them, and it didn't matter that more than 60 courts have looked, have been, uh, had the opportunity to have evidence presented to show election fraud, and they threw all the cases out because there was no there there. 10,000 prophets prophesying things that don't come to pass. We call that false prophets. And then finally, Matthew 24, 23, and 24, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe it, for false messiahs, false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray if possible, who? So, Seventh-day Adventists are not immune from deception, are we? None of us are immune. We live in a very confusing age, in an age of counterfeits, and we need to make sure that we know that we find the real Jesus. Now, <clears throat> it may come as a surprise that besides you know, those who claim to be Christ, there's really a lot of Jesuses in our culture today. I was reading some years ago, a writer went in search of the American Jesus, and he was surprised at how many Jesuses he found. And I'm reading this, and he's talking about finding a Jesus in drag and uh, I want to say in, in uh, Greenwich Village in New York City, you know, a gay Jesus, and he found a gangbanger Jesus in South Central Los Angeles, you know, with the baggy clothes and all, and, and the Jesus of a Orlando, Florida mega church who wanted everyone to drive a BMW, you know, the Jesus of the prosperity gospel. And I'm reading this, and the light bulb is going off in my head. So I grew up in a very secular Jewish uh, New York home, you know, New York City home, and I didn't go to church, I didn't go to synagogue, I had no Bible study or any religious upbringing, but I was remembering that coming up as a kid, there were two Jesuses that I remember. The black Jesus had a big fro. Anybody remember that guy? You know, in the black power age and, you know, the civil rights movement, you had the black Jesus and the white Jesus well, he was kind of Northern European looking, you know, light skinned, kind of dirty, light brown, shoulder length hair, right? It was always shoulder length hair, flowing white robes and sandals. Well, the white Jesus was a hippie like we were. He was one of us. And I'm, I'm reading this passage and the light bulb's going off and I'm like, so we all tend to create Jesus in our own image. You know, we, we create a Jesus that we can relate to, that we're comfortable with, who's not too demanding, right? He, 
He takes us as we are. We, we fit. And, uh, you know, over the years I've wondered, well, what is the Adventist Jesus like? And um, for a long time, all I could come up with was, well, obviously the Adventist Jesus was a vegan, right? And he didn't really eat that fish on the beach after his resurrection. That's the Adventist Jesus, right? Well, that, that's kind of silly. But then I, 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 I came up with the notion that, well, you know, the Adventist Jesus really wasn't out feeding the 5,000, you know, multiplying the loaves and fishes. He was sitting in church debating the finer points of theology with the brethren. Um, and, and when I've shared that with some of my pastor friends, they're like, yeah, that kind of fits, doesn't it? Um, <clears throat> we tend to create Jesus in our own image, but, but brothers and sisters... These Jesuses that we create, they have no power to save us. And, and one of the things that really struck me as I was thinking through this, I, I ask a lot of questions. And one of the questions I've been asking over the years, when we think about the first angel's message, which is kind of, you know, our mission is, uh, as, as people is the three angels' messages. This is what defines us as, as an Adventist people, is, is our role in giving these messages, our calling. And, and I look at how it's phrased in Scripture, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven, earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And, and my question is, why is the final call to worship expressed like this? to worship the creator in the hour of his judgment. And it struck me when I'm reading about all these Jesuses, the gay Jesus and the gangbanger Jesus and the prosperity gospel Jesus, and I'm remembering the hippie Jesus and the black power Jesus, all these different Jesuses, and I realize the only one who can save us is the creator Jesus who wants to recreate us in his own image. And that's the first angel's message, is for us to flee from all of these idols of Jesus and to return to the worship of the creator, right? The one who gave his son to die for us because he loves us so much. So we live in an age of counterfeits. We've got all of these false images of Jesus um, surrounding us. And... Now we are faced with a spiritual movement that I'm convinced is absolutely consistent with the pages of Revelation and, and, and the counterfeit religion that the Bible tells us to be aware of. The New Apostolic Reformation is about 50 years old, and it's gaining millions, hundreds of millions of adherents all over the globe. It has its own self-appointed apostles and prophets, um, very strong belief in supernatural signs and wonders, uh, and emphasis on spiritual warfare. The, the apostles are called to be the generals in the battle to establish the kingdom of God, to lead the church triumphant, to establish the kingdom of God as a present reality. Now, I was reading more in this one book by Christian theologians explaining the, you know, and, and critiquing the theology of this movement, and I found out that they have their own concept of present truth, of new truth, and also of the latter reign, um, all kinds of things that, that Seventh-day Adventists believe they take in a very different direction. And it's very much built on this um, theology of dominionism. Uh, you may have heard something about dominionism or reconstructionism. It is absolutely front and center mainstream in uh, the Christian religious movements that are supporting uh, conservative politics in our country today. And it's the idea that God is calling on the saints to exercise dominion over every aspect of human life. They talk about the seven mountains of 
religion, family, education, government, media, arts and entertainment, and business. And so it's, it's very much a desire to have a hostile takeover of the world um, by those who are Bible-believing Christians, except they're not actually Bible-believing Christians. Now, one of the things that strikes me about this movement, and as I've been studying into it, I realized that it absolutely fits the description of those that Jesus says are going to be on the wrong road in the last days. In the Sermon on the Mount, what does Jesus say? Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, we have focused on, you know, the next phrase, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And, you know, and, and rightly so, we, we talk about keeping the commandments of God and keeping the Sabbath and making sure, you know, that, that we're not the wrong group of Lord, Lord, but, you know, we're on the right side of this. But notice what he says next. On that day. On what day? Well, on the day that we're answering for our faith, right? On judgment day. On that day, many will say to me, what? They'll be boasting about what? Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Prophets. Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Spiritual warfare. And do many mighty works in your name. Belief in supernatural signs and wonders. Mighty works. And of course we have in Revelation 13, they will deceive those who dwell on the earth by means of the miracles and the mighty works that they do. And Jesus says, you know, who are you? I don't know who you are. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So, there's a lot of confusion and deception in the name of Jesus. And the, the New Apostolic Reformation has taken spiritual warfare in a very disturbing direction. Because now, if your political views differ from theirs, you're not just, you know, of a different party or a different persuasion, you are demonically, uh, if not possessed, influenced. So the other side are demon controlled. And they actually teach that there is a portal above the White House that the demons use to access the leaders in the government. It's that level of spiritual warfare. Everything is now black and white, and it's, you know, it's us against them. So, the New Apostolic Reformation is kind of the, you know, the true believers at the heart of what's come to be known as Christian nationalism. But Christian nationalism is a wide spectrum of people and co levels of commitment. So, you know, if you think about like a scale of one to 10, you know, where those who are a 10 are totally committed and those who are one are totally opposed, you've got a small group that are gonna be in the like nine, 10 range. You're gonna have a, you know, you're gonna have that bell curve, right? Where most people are gonna fall somewhere closer to the middle. Um, so it's not that you know, all Christians are Christian nationalists, but all of us probably have, are influenced to some extent by Christian nationalism. So what is it? Well, Catherine Stewart is a researcher, a writer, who has spent more than a decade visiting the rallies and the churches and, re and talking with people and from the ground level looking at what this movement is. And her very insightful book, I think the title speaks volumes, is called The Power Worshippers. And she writes, and we're going to talk about this more this afternoon, Christian nationalism, it's, it's not a religious creed. <coughs> it's a political ideology. 
It promotes the myth that the American Republic was founded as a Christian nation. And that's a subject we're going to take up this afternoon as well and, and really look at what is Christian about America as a Christian nation. <coughs> it asserts that legitimate government rests not on the consent of the governed. Now, I don't know, Glenn, where you went, but not to put you on the spot, but you just had civics in high school, and isn't that what we're taught in, in high school? That, you know, we the people is how the Constitution began, right? Our government rests on the consent of we the people. But Christian nationalism says it rests on adherence to the doctrines of a specific religious, ethnic, and cultural heritage. In other words, their religious and cultural heritage. It demands that our laws be based not on the reasoned deliberation of our democratic institutions, but on particular idiosyncratic interpretations of the Bible. In other words, their interpretation of the Bible, which, by the way, is not the same as ours, as Seventh-day Adventists. It is in part, and because we have shared values with our Christian brothers and sisters, we are easily drawn into the same movement and the same politics. And we'll talk more about that this afternoon. Its defining fear is that the nation has strayed from the truths that once made it great. Now, how are we as Adventists to think about what happens when we see the church in America pursuing political power? because that's what we're seeing. And whether we agree with certain policy objectives or disagree, clearly the church has become, the American evangelical movement, united with Catholicism, has become very powerful politically. Well, Ellen White had brilliant insight into this, as she did with so many, uh, many things. And in Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, where she's writing about the passage in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is talking about <clears throat> not um, uh, worrying about the speck in your brother's eye, but dealing with the log that you have in your own eye, she says this, what the church has done whenever she has lost the grace of Christ Finding herself destitute of the power of love, she has reached out for the strong arm of the state to enforce her dogmas and execute her decrees. Here, she says, is the secret of all religious laws that have ever been enacted and the secret of all persecution from the days of Abel to our own time. And in the simplest and most eloquent expression of what religious liberty means, she says, Christ does not drive. I can get you the slides. You don't need to take pictures. I'm happy to have you email me, and uh, I have a whole folder I can share with you of, of slide presentations. But I, I, by all means, uh, write down the, the reference, Mount of Blessing 126. Um, Christ does not drive, but draws men unto him. The only compulsion he employs is the constraint of love. Right? That's it. In a nutshell, and in Desire of Ages, she says, you know, um, <clears throat> only by love is love awakened. Um, it, it can't be by force or coercion, right? Only by love is love awakened. And we think, well, of course, all Christians understand this, but no, they don't. And so she continues, when the church begins to seek for the support of secular power, which she's been doing now for the past generation, it is evident that she is devoid of the power of Christ, the constraint of divine love. In a nutshell, a church that has lost the blessing and the power of the Holy Spirit seeks political power as a substitute. And that brothers and sisters, is exactly what Revelation 13 is telling us leads to the mark 
of the beast. A church that has lost the power of God, that borrows as its example, it forms an image of church-state relations during the thousand-year, 1260-year period, where church and state worked very, very closely together. The church seeks a political alliance. And how many times in Scripture do we read the prophets warning Judah and warning Ephraim not to rely on the weak reed of Egypt, right? Not to trust in princes, right? Over and over and over again, we are to trust in the Lord alone. Now, <clears throat> this gentleman is very um, influential. His name is Russell Moore. Uh, Russell Moore uh, currently is the editor of Christianity Today, which is as mainstream a Christian magazine as ever there was. Um, brilliant guy. Uh, I've been reading this book that he wrote, Losing Our Religion, An Altar Call for Evangelical America. And um, he has a lot of insight into the state of the American church. But one thing that caught my attention, and, and I will say, in, in fairness, the title, Losing Our Religion, is kind of a play on words. Because on the one hand, he's saying, yeah, we've lost it. We've lost our focus. And, uh, you know, we've really lost the heart of our religion. But he's also saying that, you know, we kind of need to lose ourselves in order to find Christ. Um, <clears throat> so it's kind of a two-edged sense there. But he was being interviewed by NPR and it's what he said in the interview that really caught my attention because he was asked why he wrote the book. What was his inspiration? And I'm going to read you what he said. Well, it was the result of having multiple pastors tell me essentially the same story about quoting the Sermon on the Mount in their preaching. Turn the other cheek. To have someone come up after and to say, where did you get those liberal talking points? And what was alarming to me is that in most of these scenarios, when the pastor would say, I'm literally quoting Jesus Christ, the response would not be, I apologize. The response would be, yes, but that doesn't work anymore. That's weak. And he says, when we get to the point where the teachings of Jesus himself are seen as subversive, then we're in a crisis. So what we have, and I've been saying this for a long time, I, I put this slide together uh, long before uh, I, 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 you know, I read Russell, what Russell Moore had to say. But the Christianity of Christian nationalism, the, the Christianity that we see in America today is a Christian religion without an authentic biblical Jesus. It's a Christianity without his teachings. They're not interested in the Sermon on the Mount. There's no, you know, blessed are the poor, blessed are the peacemakers, love your enemy, love your neighbor. There's no beating your swords into plowshares. Um, more like it, it's uh, a religion that puts the Second Amendment above the teachings of Jesus. Um, what we have is an idolatrous patriotism that confuses American power with the kingdom of God. And that's what Revelation 13 describes. It says the worship of the beast. He makes all worship the beast and its image. Well, think about the symbolism. In prophecy, a beast represents a nation or an empire. So the worship of the beast is a patriotism taken to an idolatrous extreme. If we're worshiping the nation, then the nation becomes, takes the place of Christ. Uh, our allegiance, you know, um, I'm very patriotic, but 
my allegiance is reserved for Christ alone. I love my country, but I don't worship my country. I really love Arizona. I'm glad we moved. I mean, I love California too. Don't get me wrong. So, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to come back to this slide this afternoon and unpack a little more the theology of the American Jesus. Um, because in an age of counterfeits, what I really want to, to do before we close is help us reorient and find the real Jesus. What is it that Jesus cares about? How do we know that we're worshiping the real Jesus? And, you know, and I've, I've been thinking about this for a long time, and, and I've, I've tried to answer this question many different ways, um, but I think Isaiah 58 really has, you know, it, it, it gets us to the heart of, of the problem. So in Isaiah 58, it begins this way. Cry, uh, cry aloud, do not hold back, the prophet is told by God. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgressions, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. So in our own minds, if we're going to put ourselves here, in the minds of the, the worshiping community, they're a nation of righteousness. They, they are devout. They're seeking God daily. And yet, in God's perspective, they're forsaking the judgment of God. They, they claim, they ask, they pray for righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted, they complain to God, and you don't see it? Why have we humbled ourselves and, and you take no knowledge of it? You don't, you don't know anything about it. You, you don't care that we're fasting and we're praying and we're being so devout and so worshipful and, and what gives, God? So we have a picture of a very religious community that somehow has gotten off on the wrong track. And... The prophet, con, you know, continuing, explains what went wrong. Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure, you oppress all your workers, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. So what's the problem? How does the prophet identify the problem with this devout community. That, you know, they think that they're so holy and righteous and so, you know, so religious, and yet something's really wrong at the heart of things, right? Well, they're not really focused on God at all. They're focused on self, on their own pleasure, and they're doing violence. They're, they're not treating people right. They're oppressing their workers and they're fighting, they're quarreling, and they're violent. This is not the spirit of God, is it? It's not what God requires of us. And so God asks the question through the prophet, you know, uh, is, is this the kind of religion that, that I require of you to be, you know, uh, to demonstrate your religion publicly, right? You know, there's a lot of talk today about public prayer, prayer in public schools, and all that. We got a guy who won a case in the Supreme Court so he could pray on the 50-yard line at the high school football game, right? He's the coach, Kennedy. What does Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? Don't be like the hypocrites praying in publicly to draw attention to themselves. Go in the closet and pray privately, right? We've got a form of godliness, a form of religion that is completely at odds with what Jesus teaches. So 
is this the fast? Is this the kind of religion that God chooses to, to humble yourself, to bow down like a reed, to spread sackcloth and ashes, and you know, this kind of public display of religiosity? Is that a day acceptable to the Lord? And, <clears throat> and he asks, and you know, rhetorically, isn't this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free. Instead of oppressing your workers, let the oppressed go free. Break every yoke. Share your bread with the hungry. Bring the homeless poor into your house. Take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. If you pour yourself out for the hungry, satisfy the desire of the afflicted. Then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom shall be as the noonday. Three times he talks about breaking the yoke, removing the yoke. What is the yoke? Well, <clears throat> you guys live in ag country, but I dare say these fields are a little large to be plowed with oxen anymore, right? But, uh, you know, back in the day, smaller fields, a yoke was a device to hook a couple of oxen together to see that they could plow the fields in a straight, straight rows. It was an implement of control, of binding, quite necessary, right? But what is it that binds us? It's sin, it's oppression, it's hunger, it's poverty. These are the things that bind us. It's wickedness. And so God says, pour yourself out for the hungry. Satisfy the desire of the afflicted. Then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. I'm sure that there are some today here who are experiencing some darkness in their life. I don't know you folks, but I do know that we all go through it. I'm praying today for a 16-year-old son of, of a close family friend who's having surgery this morning. He's play, he was playing high, he was quarterbacking his high school football team with great prospects for college and even pro football, and he got tackled and his hand is pretty much destroyed and they're trying to put it back together. So I'm praying for Luke, and if you could remember to, to pray for a young man named Luke with me. Um, you know, his mom and dad are in that tunnel right now where they don't know if there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I've been in that tunnel. I've wondered, you know, is there really a way out? Is there a light? And, and most of us, at some point in our lives, we don't just get to skate through and everything is hunky-dory. Most of us, at some point, we find ourselves in that tunnel and we're hanging on by a thread wondering if there really is hope, wondering if there's a light somewhere. <clears throat> and I don't know if any of you are going through that today, but there is a promise that God will be our light that it will rise in the darkness and our gloom shall be as the noonday when we turn our hearts to him and follow his, his ways. The promise that the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. So we all had a lot of rain last winter. I don't know what it's like here in the valley uh, since spring. Um, in Arizona, we had good rain last winter, but we have not had any rain uh, in the last six months or so. In Arizona, we usually get the monsoons in August, in July and August, and we get some good rains, and they're really, really necessary. We didn't really get any monsoons this year. There were storms circling, and a little bit here and a little bit there. We didn't get any, on, really, on our property. Um, so this imagery of being like a watered garden, 
When you live in a desert, it really speaks to you, right? When, you know, we're all living with water shortages and uh, the various states along the Colorado River struggling to figure out how to allocate water and, and, and how to deal with a limited supply of water. But the promise that God gives us is to make us like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Wonderful imagery if we abandon trying to yoke people to do what, you know, to, to control. If we let go of having to control other people, that's what the yoke is, right? An implement of control. And instead set them free to experience freedom in Christ because Christ loves us and died for us. The message of Isaiah 58, in a nutshell, is that religious conformity isn't enough, right? It doesn't matter how much we engage in religious behavior if our hearts are not changed to be in tune with God and to have compassion for others. Um, the false fasting is narcissistic. Its, em its emphasis is on ourselves. And we think that somehow self-denial is how we draw near to God. Because we don't do this, we don't do that, we don't do the other thing. And we make life miserable for our kids. And we think that that's somehow a sign that we're holy. It's not. False fasting is never a cover for oppressing workers, for social injustice, uh, for economic oppression. True religion is shown through compassion, through love of neighbor, uh, through caring for those who are hungry, and thirsty, etc. So Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So there's the yoke that the world puts upon us, the yoke that we put upon one another, where we, we try to control others, and the world tries to control us and oppress us. And then there's the yoke that Jesus puts upon us, which is a yoke of love. He wants us to be controlled by the spirit of compassion and love for one another. And he wants us to learn from him, for he is gentle and lowly in heart. And when we do, we will find true shalom, true rest and peace for our souls. And that, brothers and sisters, is what we're doing here today by coming to worship in church on Shabbat, on Sabbath. This is a day of rest and joy and peace to find in the presence of God, is it not? And so, uh, you know, I have some more slides, but I'm looking at the clock, and I'm going to wrap it up right here. I'm going to ask you to pray with me that we would find, that each of us would find rest and peace for our souls, that we would find the Jesus who is meek and lowly in heart, and not the one who wants to control our politics and our government and tell everybody what to do. Let's pray. Father in heaven, the real Jesus died to save us. He's not exclusive. He's inclusive. The real Jesus wants us, has already welcomed us into your family. And we're so grateful. We want to tell you that we love you. And yes, we want to learn of this Jesus, to be meek, to release the things that bind others, to release the yoke of bondage to sin and oppression, of the bondage of, of poverty and hunger. And we want to let go, Lord, of the desire to control one another, to control what people believe and what people do and to think that they have to believe and do exactly the way we do or else. 
Lord, we are all your children. And I pray if there's any of us going through that dark tunnel of gloom in our lives today, whether it be health-related or spiritually or financially, economically, maybe we've lost jobs or we're on the rocks financially, whatever it may be, Lord. Maybe it's marriages falling apart. Maybe it's kids who are on the wrong road. Lord, we know that there is light with you. And I pray right now that you would give each one of us hope and peace and assurance of your love for us. And if there's anyone here who, who is really struggling and has not fully given their lives to you, you don't need to answer to me. You don't need to raise your hand. You don't need to get up out of your seat and come down and march down here and make a show of anything. But you have an opportunity to, to say yes to Jesus in your heart of hearts right now and to just tell Jesus, yes, you know, I've been holding out on you. And I really do want to belong to you and to know you and to love you and to serve you. I want you to be my savior. And I want you to have my heart today. And I pray that, that each of us in our own way would say that to Jesus. We ask in the blessed name of Jesus, amen. God bless you, brother. So in the post-COVID era, I really haven't been shaking 